New Orleans, Louisiana, the Crescent City, the Big Easy. During Mardi Gras, the definitive party town where revelers annually set records for alcohol consumption. But there is another form of spirit for which New Orleans is known. For centuries, tourists and residents have witnessed ghostly apparitions from the mythical city's past. A voodoo queen lurks the grounds of her Gothic cemetery plot. A highly respected socialite reminds others of her secret, malicious past. And children of a wealthy plantation owner continue to play on the grounds they once loved before they and their mother were murdered. This is the story of the spirits of New Orleans and how they make themselves known today in the legendary Crescent City. Stories of the supernatural, fact or fiction. Through a veil of sightings and encounters, we catch a glimpse of our historical past on our journey through haunted history. Louisiana is a city of striking contrasts. Its reputation for Bourbon Street jazz and French Quarter celebrations is balanced by the stately southern tradition exhibited by nearby plantations. Not surprisingly, contrast is reflected in the city's history as well. New Orleans is not the kind of city that's a typical American city. For instance, it was primarily Catholic, primarily French and Spanish, with a large admixture of Afro-American, African influences. The influences of French and Spanish explorers and the African slaves they brought with them blend together in a cultural mix that is truly unique in the United States. But where there is cultural diversity, there is also conflict. And where there is conflict, there is often untimely death. Many believe that conflict has much to do with the spirits from the past that continue to haunt the Big Easy. You have to realize that New Orleans had the highest mortality rate in North America up until 1900, when that much death and havoc are in an area, in an area that was born out of chaos, crime, corruption, like this city is known for. And that's always going to leave some sort of residual negativity or residual spirits. In the early 1800s, New Orleans landowners and socialites depended heavily on slave labor. Both male and female slaves were used for strenuous duties in the cotton fields, as well as more refined duties as domestic servants in the homes of the city's upper class. Despite all the hardships suffered by slaves in the early 1800s, none can compare to what happened in this building on Royal Street in the city's French Quarter. The structure was once the scene of despicable horrors performed by a prominent member of the city's social elite. In 1834, the Royal Street home belonged to Madame Delphine McCarty Lalaurie, a sophisticated society belle, Madame Lalaurie was known throughout the city for her lavish entertainments and grand balls. Madame Lalaurie was married to a physician, Dr. Leonard Louis Nicholas Lalaurie, also a highly respected member of the community. Together, they lived the luxurious lifestyle of southern aristocrats. But the public demeanor of this couple was a hideous charade. Lurking behind the charming smiles were the souls of sadists, a fact that came to light on April 10th, 1834. A fire broke out in the kitchen of the mansion and quickly spread throughout the structure. When firemen arrived, they found a strange barred door leading to the attic. When they forced the door open to check for smoldering embers, the firemen smelled the unmistakable odor of death 
and witnessed a sight sickening beyond belief. The New Orleans Bee newspaper described what the firemen witnessed in its April 11, 1834 edition. Upon entering, the most appalling spectacle met their eyes. Seven slaves, more or less horribly mutilated, were seen suspended by the neck, with their limbs apparently stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. Language is powerless and inadequate to give a proper conception of the horror which a scene like this must have inspired. We shall not attempt it, but leave it to the reader's imagination to picture what it was. Reporter, New Orleans B. I would imagine the best way to describe it would be Frankenstein experiments, where um, uh, limbs had been broken and reset in strange angles, amputations, skin grafting, uh, just really bizarre kinds of medical experiments. Word of the atrocities quickly spread. The savagery of Madame LaLaurie and her physician husband was simply too much for the community to bear. The people who lived here were aghast that something of this nature would happen. A lynch party uh, evolved and she and her husband escaped by the skin of their teeth, so to speak, uh, being pursued by a mob who was, who was ready to hang them for their transgressions. Madame LaLaurie and her husband were never seen again. Some believe they moved to northern Louisiana. Others heard that the couple immigrated to France. The Lullery Mansion went through a series of new owners. In the late 1800s, during renovation of the house, workmen tearing up floorboards apparently found several human skeletons, the remains of other slaves whose demise had been hidden from the public for years. Many of the mansion's new owners and their employees reported frightening incidents they could only associate with the spirits of the madame herself and the slaves that she and her husband brutalized. On some occasions, the sightings of Madame La Lurie have been relatively benign, such as the time she was spotted simply leaning over the crib of an infant. But at other times, Madame's darker side returned. In the late 19th century, a sleeping servant found himself literally being strangled by the ghost of Madame La Lurie. He awoke to see what appeared to be a sort of translucent white female with black hair, very pale features, very attractive, but with a very maniacal look on her face, choking him. Um, he's preserved by a pair of black hands who break her grip from around his throat. And the specter then screams and disappears. So this is um, evidently she and her slaves are still having at each other. Spirits of the slaves themselves have also been spotted, but unlike the spirit of Madame La Lurie, they have never done harm. In the 1890s, when the La Lurie home had been converted to a boarding house, a fruit peddler climbed this like a startling discovery. This individual came back to his lodgings after a day's work, uh, mounted the steps to go to his room, and he finds on the steps a black male who was naked with the exception of being chained, being shackled. The man immediately approached this fella to demand to know what he was doing, and he lunged towards this figure. And when he did, the figure just simply disappeared. Today, the Lallerie building is home to a trendy French Quarter restaurant. But to the students of New Orleans' haunted history, it stands as a reminder of Madame Lallerie's shameful past. I imagine if she hasn't found peace, she probably could still be haunting the old house and roaming looking for blood and satisfaction. We now return to Haunted History. A walk through St. Louis Cemetery number one in New Orleans is literally a walk through history. Out of all the grave sites, one is most commonly visited. It is easily found because of a series of red X's scratched with brick onto the front of the tomb. 
Visitors make the marks as a form of voodoo prayer, for this is the grave of New Orleans' most famous voodoo queen, Marie Laveau. When anyone mentions the word voodoo, the images that come to mind are those of zombies and witches. Satanism, black magic, and primeval tribal dance undulations. All images primarily introduced by television and motion pictures. But true voodoo, as originated in Louisiana in the early 1800s, is far from the widely publicized stereotype. In fact, voodoo is first and foremost a religion. An unusual mixture of traditional African beliefs and Roman Catholicism. It was facilitated because the voodooists and um, others who practiced traditional African religions saw many similarities between the voodoo gods and the Catholic saints. And it was forbidden for the African ancestors to practice their own religion. So under the guise of practicing Roman Catholicism, they practiced or worshipped a voodoo god. The most famous practitioner of voodoo was Marie Laveau. Born in 1794, Laveau was a mulatto of mixed black, white, and Indian blood. As such, she was from birth a free woman of color. After a failed marriage, Laveau supported herself by working as a hairdresser to the wealthy white and Creole women of New Orleans. At this time, she also learned the practices of voodoo. As a result of her talent for the theatrical, her business acumen, and her personal charisma, Marie's reputation soon eclipsed that of other voodoo queens. Under Marie Laveau's guidance, voodoo rituals held at Lake Pontchartrain became huge spectacles, particularly the ritual held every year on June 24th, St. John's Eve. The St. John's Eve ritual uh, occurs during the time of the summer solstice, and St. John that they're speaking about is St. John the Baptist, who became equated with the voodoo god. So that St. John's Eve ritual is a perfect example of how many cultures have uh, mixed and come together. Marie Laveau's reputation knew no racial boundaries. People of all colors came to her for aid and advice. One of Marie's most famous visitors was a Louisiana aristocrat whose son had been accused of rape and was awaiting trial. The father came to Marie for help in gaining an acquittal. Marie's approach began with a mixture of a special grigri, a combination of herbs, roots, and oils ground together and placed in a small bag. Marie placed the bag on the judge's doorstep with a note proclaiming the young man's innocence. As part of her ritual, Marie then inserted three guinea peppers into her mouth and placed the peppers under the judge's chair. Then came the trial and the verdict, not guilty. Everyone was happy and in gratitude to the great voodoo queen, she was given a gift of a white house. This house was called Maison Blanche, which in French means white house. And it was the uh, site of a lot of uh, voodoo activities. While many skeptics might question the true effect of Laveau's work on the outcome of the trial, those who walk in her footsteps foster no doubts. I believe that Marie Laveau's intervention helped this aristocrat and his son because as a priestess myself, I know the power of prayer and I know the power of ritual. And I know it was not just wishful thinking or something that just happened. For the followers of voodoo, Marie Laveau's spirit lives on in New Orleans parlors where Grigri potions are still mixed today. But apparitions of Marie seem to also have appeared, even to non-believers. New Orleans is a city of spirits. 
It's a very mystical place. And Marie Laveau is a legend. Some say she has manifested herself as a crow. Edgar Allan Poe, the Raven, and all of these notwithstanding. She once lived in the 1000 block of St. Anne Street in New Orleans. And spirits like to frequent the places where they once lived. So people have uh, allegedly seen her there. And then, of course, the cemetery, which is the place of all place of spirits. Marie has been cited there. But whatever manifestation she has taken, uh, her presence is still very much felt here. And people from all over the world come and we seek the aid of her, her spirit to help us. Marie Laveau is still with us today. She is present. She is just as present as any saint in the church, as any family ancestor that has gone before us. She is with us today. A voodoo parlor of New Orleans is one of the few places where the contrasting worlds of African tradition and Southern aristocracy would meet. But New Orleans aristocrats have their own spiritual legends to tell. We now return to Haunted History. While Canal Street and the French Quarter quickly became established as the heart of New Orleans nightlife, the aristocracy found life on the surrounding plantations much more to their liking. The Myrtles Plantation was built in 1796 by General David Bradford. For 650 acres of land, he paid $1.25 per acre. What Bradford and subsequent owners did not realize is that the land was originally taken by the Spanish from the Tunica Indians. What Bradford and subsequent owners did not realize is that the land was originally taken by the Spanish from the Tunica Indians who used it as a burial ground. As any student of haunted history knows, Indian burial grounds are commonly the locations of supernatural activity. Judge Clark Woodruff, a law school colleague of General Bradford, subsequently took over the plantation. Woodruff, at age 35, married Bradford's daughter, Sarah Matilda, who was only 14. Together, according to plantation historians, they had three daughters, Mary, Jane, and Octavia. As was the custom at this time, domestic servants handled many of the household chores on a plantation. One particular slave girl handled the duties for the Woodruff family. Chloe was her name, and Chloe was a nanny over the children. So whatever they needed, she would have took care of them. It's also believed that later uh, something was going on with Chloe and Judge Woodruff, that he took her on as a mistress. As a domestic servant, Chloe was in a key position to learn information that would affect other slaves on the property. She frequently eavesdropped on Judge Woodruff's conversations, letting other slaves know about pending sales or trades that might break up their families. But then, a disaster. Chloe was caught, and her punishment was severe. One of her ears was cut off. From that day on, Chloe always wore a scarf that covered her wound. Out of fear of banishment from her prestigious household position, Chloe developed a plan. In the privacy of the plantation kitchen, Chloe boiled the leaves of an oleander plant which grew on the plantation grounds. The boiling process produced a poisonous liquid similar to arsenic. Chloe then mixed the liquid into the batter for a birthday cake she was preparing for one of the children. But her goal was not murder. We feel that her intention with the oleander was to make the children sick, along with their mother, 
already knowing what was wrong, she would be able to come in, take care of them, prove to them that she was the one to still manage the household and take care of the children, and she would not be sent to the fields. On the night the birthday cake was served, the infant Octavia had already been put to bed. Judge Woodruff was away on business. The delicious cake was happily consumed by Jane, Mary, and their mother, Sarah Matilda. But Chloe's plan backfired horribly. The oleander mixture was stronger than she had anticipated. And within hours, the two young girls and their mother were dead. Chloe received the ultimate punishment. After Chloe confessed to the poisoning, she was killed. And she was killed by a mixed mob. Uh, black and whites together who were upset of what she had done to the children and she was hung here on the grounds. Today Myrtle's plantation has been restored as a bed and breakfast establishment. Visitors at the Myrtles have reported seeing the spirits of Chloe, the two murdered children, and their mother, Sarah Matilda. One night, a guest arrived late in the evening to see a young girl sitting on a bed, swinging her legs, dressed in a white gown. The next morning, the guest, thinking the child was the daughter of friends also staying at the Myrtles, remarked how much the child had grown. His friends explained that they had not brought their daughter along on this particular trip. I really believe that he may have saw one of the judge's children they tend to show themselves always wearing the white dress. And he said it was a gown, but it's very close to it. We believe that it was one of the judge's children. Still other guests have reported seeing visions of two young girls playing gleefully on the plantation grounds. We've had some guests come to visit and they've had children with them. And the children like to show themselves to other children. And they've said that they've played with girly friends. We've had no other guests on the grounds that evening with children with them. The children's poisoned mother has also made her presence known, always seen on the home's main staircase. Maybe she's trying to see who's coming to her home. We don't know. But she keeps a very low, very low profile and we believe it could be Sarah Matilda. Tour guide Hester Eby herself has come into contact with what she feels are spirits from the past. I have myself been upstairs before and I try not to go upstairs alone, but I have been upstairs and coming down the back staircase, you can hear the sounds of someone else taking a step. They're walking along with you and when you stop, that sound will stop. For the Myrtles Plantation, the sadness of a family's tragedy over a century ago continues to be felt today. It was a sad time in a lot of ways, and because the Myrtles is on top of Indian burial ground, um, adds to some things, but people were killed violently sometimes, and things happen here, and those things you can't do anything about, and sometimes they want to let you know that they're still here and they do it very well here. The spirits who apparently haunt New Orleans are not all victims of violent deaths. One woman passed away peacefully and continues to watch over her unusual home, the Mississippi Riverboat Delta Queen. We now return to Haunted History. As the southernmost port of the Mississippi River, New Orleans has always played a major role in the evolution of river transportation. Today, the river is a highway for cargo-filled freighters and luxurious steamboats. Steamboats may seem unlikely places for hauntings to occur, but one ship in particular, the Delta Queen, has a fascinating spiritual past. From 1811 to 1900, steamboats powered development, 
growth and trade for the cities and states along the Mississippi. But by the end of the 19th century, the ships had all but vanished. River transport had lost out to the more reliable railroad. As steamboat lines closed one after the other, one man, Captain Gordon C. Green, refused to see the image of a paddle-wheel riverboat die. Starting a company now known as the Delta Queen Steamboat Company, Green purchased his first steamboat, the H.K. Bedford. Shortly thereafter, he married Mary Becker from Marietta, Ohio. By 1895, Mary B. Green had learned enough at her husband's side to join a handful of women licensed to pilot steamboats. Soon, she became a full-fledged riverboat captain. Captain Gordon Green died in 1927, leaving the Green line of ships in the hands of his wife, Mary, and their sons, Tom and Chris. When Captain Chris died of a heart attack at age 43, Captain Tom set a goal to provide steamboat... Captain Chris died of a heart attack at age 43. Captain Tom set a goal to provide steamboat lovers with the finest craft ever to travel the waters of the Mississippi. In 1946, he found it in the steamer Delta Queen. Built in 1926, the ship had been commandeered for army use in World War II and painted a drab gray. After an extensive $750,000 renovation, the Delta Queen made her maiden passenger voyage on June 30th, 1948. Captain Mary herself piloted the vessel during the early months. A room aboard the Delta Queen was specifically fitted out as her home. Unfortunately, Mary died less than a year later, having been a riverboat captain for 55 years. Just before she passed away, Mary was quoted as saying, were I to live over again, I wouldn't miss a day of the life I've enjoyed. After her death, Mary B. Green's physical presence may have left the Delta Queen, but many feel that her spirit still inhabits the famous ship. In 1982, first mate Mike Williams became a believer when he was sleeping in his bunk all alone on the ship during a winter layover. Somewhere along uh, 1.30, 2 a.m., I was awakened by a sound. It was a sound as if someone had bent down close to my ear and said, psst. And uh, I realized that I had just come out of a deep sleep, and I thought, boy, that's, that's an interesting dream. I was just starting to drift off to sleep again and in my darkened room, when this time very distinctly and very close to my ear, and I could feel breath blow on me, there was another psst, and uh, it, it was very frightening. Mike decided to investigate, thinking someone had come on board. I got down to the bottom of the staircase, and there was a loud slam. A door had slammed in the aft cabin lounge, uh, back halfway back on our, our, what we call the cabin deck. Once again, it, it startled me, and I proceeded down uh, the aft steps towards the engine room. And lo and behold, I stopped and paused and I heard water gurgling. Mike climbed down the steps to a large intake pipe where water would normally circulate from the river to supply the boilers when the vessel was in operation. There he made a frightening discovery. A hole had rusted through the pipe and water was gushing into the engine room with the stream of a fire hose. Mike made a hasty temporary repair, called his chief on shore, and the two made a permanent repair. Now, had I not been awakened by whoever or whatever and not discovered this, there's a good chance the Delta Queen would have filled with water and sunk. I'm convinced that there's a benevolent, gentle old lady who keeps an eye out over the boat. I'm sure it's Captain Mary Green. This was not to be the only time Mike Williams would be touched by the spirit of Mary Green. 
On another occasion, as the ship was underway in the middle of the night, Mike received a phone call in his cabin from a young woman named Myra Frugé, who had just started working in the ship's purser's office. She said she had just received a call from an old lady uh, down in the cabin area who had complained over the phone that she was cold and she wasn't feeling well and she needed someone to come take a look at her. I said, I'll, I'll hurry down and I'll check it out. When Mike reached the elderly woman's room, he knocked and there was no answer. After knocking again, he feared that the woman might be in severe distress, so he opened the door with his pass key. Opened the door, the room was empty. Not only was it empty, it was unoccupied. So I thought, hmm, that's strange. And uh, I thought, well, perhaps it was an old lady who had made a mistake on which cabin she was in and had called from a different location. Mike went to the purser's office to confirm that he had been sent to the right cabin. He found a slightly shaken Myra Frugé. Myra sat there and she said, you know, uh, something funny's going on here. She said, I had a strange feeling that I was being watched through the window. And I said, uh, you're kidding. She said, no. And I turned around and looked and there was an old lady looking at me through the window. Because Myra was still shaken by the incident, Mike offered to walk her back to her cabin. On the way, they passed historical photos from the Delta Queen's past. Myra and I were walking along, just chatting quietly so as not to disturb anyone, when she looked at these photos and she grabbed my arm and it stopped, and her eyes grew wide, and she was really shaken. And I said, what's wrong with you? And she said, that's her. I said, who? She said, that's the lady who just stared at me through the window. I said, it can't be. That's Captain Mary Green. She died in the 40s. And she looked back at me and she said, that's her. As fate, and perhaps Mary B. Green would have it, this was just the beginning for Mike Williams and Myra Frugé. The moral of the story is that uh, Things did progress, and Myra Frugé is now my wife, Myra Williams, and we have an 11-year-old daughter. Now, uh, uh, and we're always proud to tell people that uh, we were in introduced by Captain Mary Green. Although Mike Williams is certain that the spirit of Mary B. Green still watches over the Delta Queen, he has never himself seen apparitions of Mary. Others, however, have. Well, it was interesting. It was the first time I had ever been on the Delta Queen, and I wasn't there as any river historian. I knew nothing about the boat or the history of it, really. I was there as a musician. Marcy Richardson, official historian for the Delta Queen, has seen visions of Mary on several occasions. She will never forget the first. Marcy was alone, reading late at night in one of the Delta Queen lounges. I noticed just peripherally somebody walking past me which I found unusual that late at night and I looked to see who it was and looked like an older woman who um, I didn't recognize but I could see this person walking I thought that's odd and you know how when you're taken away from your reading you look up and then you look back again by the time I did the double take she was gone when this happened the third night in a row Marcy became concerned enough to tell the ship's cruise director who asked Marcy to describe the woman Marcy was shown a picture of the legendary female riverboat captain. I said, who on earth is that? And then he started telling me about Mary Green. So, and, and, and that was who I saw. I mean, there was no doubt about it. I mean, she could have just been photographed. Mary Green may have also made her presence known to ship entertainer Phyllis Dale when she left her cabin late at night to use a restroom. Immediately in front of me was a, a lady in a long green velvet robe. I followed her and she made a turn and I turned and she wasn't there anymore. The next day Phyllis confronted the ship's captain. I asked Captain Shinkari if what this what he thought of made of this and he said Phyllis he said you've only been on the Delta Queen a few months he says you probably don't know that we have a ghost on board the ghost of Mary Green 
For the crew and guests of the Delta Queen, Mary Green's presence aboard the ship does not make them fearful. In fact, it lets them rest easier at night. In fact, it lets them rest easier at night. I don't get a feeling that she's a, a troubled spirit. I think that she's quite content doing what she's doing, which is seeing the vessel along through the years so that uh, it continues to be a, a time capsule, just absorbing the energy of the people who've been there. But oh yeah, she's there. From Mississippi river boats to stately plantations, New Orleans spirits apparently refuse to leave their beloved homes. But none of the legends can compare to incidents witnessed still to this day at a French quarter theater called Le Petit. We now return to haunted history. Historians and non-historians alike would acknowledge that all of New Orleans is a form of theater. From the Mardi Gras kings and queens who annually don garish costumes, to the average tourist on Bourbon Street who suddenly undergoes a change of personality, life in New Orleans is filled with laughter and tears, comedy and tragedy, in short, a sense of theater. One venue in the French Quarter serves as an eloquent historical metaphor for the contrast of emotion that defines New Orleans. It also may provide a glimpse into the supernatural. The Le Petit Theater opened its doors to the public in 1922. Prior to that time, the building had survived fires and reconstruction dating back to the late 18th century. But it took the dramatic elements of theater to truly bring the structure to life and to bring about the return of deceased theater participants who apparently never wanted to leave. From actresses to carpenters to the ghosts of children roaming the attic, the theater has truly been a circus of ghost-like activity. Perhaps the most famous figure is an actress named Caroline, who has been known to help corral the mischievous young spirits whose presence no one can explain. But Caroline's was a sorrowful fate. While wearing a wedding dress for the role of a new bride, romance turned to tragedy. Caroline seemed to be a beautiful young actress. The rumor has it that she was having an affair with someone here. She was married. So I suppose they had little clandestine meetings up on the roof over in the courtyard. No one knows exactly what happened that day, but it seems somehow she fell. Her head cracked open and she died. So even though she died abruptly, with that proverbial unfinished business that always keeps people lurking around, they say she's still here, but in a benevolent way, helping people, interacting with them. Images of Caroline on the back stairs of the theater have been seen by many employees. Several set designers and technical directors acknowledge having asked the spirit of Caroline for assistance. Stephen Thurber once sought her help as he searched the attic for a sword. I couldn't find this prop for production and I knew I'd put it up there months ago. And couldn't find it, looked all over, needed it for the rehearsal that night. So one of the things that myself and the other people who worked here uh, used to do was ask Caroline to help us find whatever we were looking for. And then in this one instance, I just walked back upstairs and there was the sword sitting in plain view, right where it wasn't there before. So as a uh, Corny as it sounds, I grab the sword, thank Caroline, and walk downstairs. Caroline was not the only actress to meet her demise at the Le Petit. Not to be upstaged, another thespian met her doom in an even more dramatic fashion. It seems that this woman wanted the part very, very badly. She thought she was getting the part. She was promised the part. Rumor also has that she was sleeping with the director for the part. I know that stuff doesn't really go up, but um, <laughs> she was sleeping with the director and was promised, and she still did not get the part. 
she hung herself on the grand drape, which would have been uh, to show everyone, I suppose, how disgruntled, to say the least, that she was. They say when you get next to that drape, that it's just very cold and icy. Hairs will stand up on edge. And that's been witnessed and felt by many people here as well. On the less traumatic side, there is also the ghost of Sigmund, a former carpenter at the theater who still considers backstage his home. Sigmund died years ago, but many continue to see him in the form of shadows, still performing his duties, and occasionally a few pranks. This is a family of ghosts here. It's like a family at home. Everybody with their own little peculiarities. Uh, he seems to like to mess with the lights during performances or uh, move the curtains down when they're not supposed to escape with props when they're needed for the very next scene. So he's a prankster, he's a poltergeist, and he hangs around for that purpose. Probably try to get even for, for some of his past uh, experiences here, or lack of raises or whatever one might linger around for. The family of ghosts at La Petite also includes the specter of a strange figure often seen sitting alone in the balcony. He always appears in white face, wearing a top hat, and no one quite knows who he could be. But none of the supernatural entities inhabiting the theater have affected any human being more dramatically than one encountered by Stephen Thurber. It happened one evening when he and two associates were walking through the library of the theater toward a door leading to the dressing rooms. Something told me not to open that door, so I told that to the other two gentlemen I was with. And they asked why, and I said, I don't know, just do not open that door, and they did anyway. And when they opened the door, all I could see was a large figure in uh, puffy sleeves or an old-time shirt came charging at me. And uh, next thing I know, I'm, wake I'm on the ground uh, with my lips split open, and the two gentlemen said that something just ran right through me and kept going. So I quickly ran out the building after that. Few visitors to New Orleans have had or ever will have an experience like that of Stephen Thurber. It is unlikely also that tourists will run into Marie Laveau at St. Louis Cemetery or Madame Lalaurie in the French Quarter. If they are lucky, however, they might catch a glimpse of happy children at Myrtle's plantation or Mary B. Green on the Delta Queen. Many believe ghosts to be a figment of our imaginations. If that is true, the city of New Orleans must be viewed as fertile ground for the curious mind. For few cities in America can lay claim to the broad range of mysterious encounters documented in the Crescent City. Do you believe in ghosts? If not, perhaps you need to walk down Bourbon Street and analyze the apparitions you see. Are they the result of the spirits in your drink? Or are they proof that spirits from another time really do exist in a place called the Big Easy?